from learntoplaymusic.com and welcome to the music space. Today my special guest is Dave Dowling, Adelaide rock guitarist. He's been teaching and playing for 25 years and he's playing lead guitar in the band Guilt Free. So don't forget um, we're here to inspire, inform and interact. Don't forget your Q&A apps and your headphones and you can uh, ask some questions on the blog or you can email us as well. So Dave, how did you get started? Uh, I think my, my earliest memory, I uh, watched the last week's uh, episode and remembered this question and I thought, when did I actually get started? And I think uh, the guitar's always been, um, was always in my house growing up. His dad was a classical guitar player. Yeah. Um, not a professional one, but, uh, but you know, always dabbled in it. Um, and uh, mum played the piano and uh, we always had a lot of music, you know, a lot of records and all that stuff around. Um, uh, but I think I first got interested in playing when I was about 14 and sat down with uh, another uh, friend who had an electric guitar at the time and was playing metallic songs and uh, I thought, wow, you know, you can actually play music that's current and, you know, that we like right now uh, and it's not all about, you know, just learning what's in the, the song books that Dad had or whatever uh, and all that kind of thing. So that was when I first really got interested in it and um, then I started picking up Dad's guitar and, and teaching myself how to play some of those things, uh, either by ear or by buying tab books. and. Uh, and learning that way, and yeah, just bought my first guitar, probably first electric guitar around 16, I think, and yeah, been really hard at it ever since, um, just trying to get better all the time, and as I got into my 20s and got a bit more serious about it, I uh, learned how to read music and, uh, you know, just pursued things a bit further from there, and went to uni quite late, but finished my music degree in uh, 2008, I think it was. Okay, yeah. and you got an honours degree. Uh, yeah, that part finished in yeah. um, 2009, so Fantastic. yeah, when I finished and uh, yeah, I've been working for um, Avid Technology ever since in, uh, in surveillance tech support, so still keeping a, uh, a foot in the music world, uh, mm -hmm. so to speak, which has uh, yeah, been pretty rewarding so far. Great. Mm. So uh, after obviously you bought your first guitar, did you uh, join any bands? Uh, not for, I, I like, sort of did, uh, you know, mates band kind of stuff. Um, you know, little trios and duos, one guy on drums and we do Metallica covers and stuff like that yeah. and just have fun. Um, but I didn't really join a band that, that properly gigged and, and did that sort of thing until at least nine years later, I think, around uh, okay. 2000, um, when I think I was probably, uh, it was a weird time being a guitarist that was really into, um, you know, glam rock and all that sort of stuff in the 90s because there was this kind of movement against that from the resurgence of punk and the grunge uh, kind of movement and um, all the guitarists on the radio didn't seem to be doing any of the stuff I was interested in no. and all of the bands I was going to see and bands that friends were in um, weren't doing any of that stuff so I kind of didn't really feel that motivated to uh, uh, to get out and play a lot um, not with a band anyway um, but then uh, around 2000 I thought you know it's been long enough of, uh, you know, got nearly 10 years experience, so I should uh, see how it goes. And um, yeah, hooked up with a band uh, so that was playing sort of industrial heavy rock, that kind of thing, and played with them for about 18 months. Did a few gigs and got that experience under my belt, and then uh, moved on to a more folk rocky uh, kind of trio after that for a while. That sort of went for about another 18 months. And then had a, I think it was another seven or eight year hiatus in between. I think when those two things never really went anywhere, I kind of maybe felt a bit uh, disheartened or something like that. But um, uh, then the last uh, three years since late 2011, I've been uh, going pretty hard with Guilt Free. I've played more gigs than ever. And uh, leading up to that, I did a lot of busking as well. Um, when I was at uni uh, from 2006 to 2008, I used to go busking every summer to supplement my income. Took okay. the electric guitar and a little amp and a iPod with backing tracks and stuff like that and just used to tear it up in the mall and down at Jetty Road at the Bay and okay. that kind of thing. It was, uh, it was good fun. Yeah, right. good way to make money. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, tell us a little bit more about your music studies. And 
why you decided to study what you did and how that's helped you? Yeah, um, well, there's sort of a couple of choices uh, when you're a... Well, there's only really, well, at the time, there's only really one serious choice as a, a rock guitarist um, if you wanted to get a music degree as a performer. Um, and Well, I mean, the choices are classical guitar or jazz um, at the con at the time. They've got a contemporary uh, music degree program there now. Um, which I'm uh, involved in teaching Survivors, which um, uh, seems to be a really good program. But um, at the time when I uh, yeah, went back to uni, um, classical and jazz was all there was. And I didn't really want to do either of those things because as much as I've enjoyed a bit of classical guitar over the years and a bit of jazz, um, I've always been much more interested in, in rock guitar and, and have found those things, you know, they interest me for a while, but then my interest wanes and I just want to get back to turning up loud. And, yeah. You know, that kind of thing. Um, but uh, then, yeah, so the other option at the time was a music technology degree. And I thought, well, you know, a big part of, of rock and, and pop is recording and, uh, and arranging and, um, and understanding the technology that you've got at your disposal. So that seemed like a, a pretty sensible choice for me. And I did the uh, certificate for... Uh, in music technology at Flinders Street School of Music when it was still yeah. operating back in 1999. Um, and uh, yeah, so it sort of seemed like a logical continuation of that some six years later or so. But uh, yeah, the uh, the result was pretty good. I think uh, I've got a, a very good understanding of the tools that I've worked with now to, okay. to capture and arrange. And that, that led to your involvement with the Sibelius That's right. program? That's right, yeah. The, um, uh, the story is the previous uh, person that was working as the technical support uh, person in Australia. The reason we have a, a local uh, technical support person for um, Sibelius in Australia is because uh, the number of users here is very high mm. per capita. Um, we have a lot of uh, uh, users in schools and all that kind of thing. So um, they need someone on the ground here to, to manage all that and, uh, and help with all the queries. So um, the last guy I left and uh, then they went straight back and he was uh, an honor student from Elder Con's music tech program yeah. as well. Uh, so they went straight back to the uh, course coordinator and said, have you got anyone else? And he put a few names yeah. in the hat and I was lucky enough to put my uh, resume forward and, and got the position. Right. So well, I have to get your number before. Mm, indeed. <laughs> you <laughs> need some technical support. <laughs> <there. laughs> I'll be hassled on you every day. <laughs> indeed. Now what do I do? So, mm. so David, uh, you're talking about how you love playing loud. Mm. So um, tell us a bit about that. Live and loud is your topic. Yeah, look, um, I think uh, live and loud is, you know, something that we all, as rock guitar players, uh, you look forward to doing it, um, but then the reality of doing it is a bit different to, to what you kind of imagine. You know, you sort of, you see, uh, um, you know, Jimmy Page you know, doing his windmills or whatever and, and cranking it up with, uh, with Robert Plant and everything sounds amazing and they're all in sync. And, and uh, what you don't really realise, uh, I think, um, as an inexperienced uh, player going into that for the first time is just how much work there is behind that to make that illusion uh, that they're so casual and laid back and yeah, exactly. you know, and they all just, I don't know, smoke pot or whatever and you know, jam all day, you know, like the, uh, the reality is much different. They actually do a lot of hard work uh, at practice time and, uh, and a lot of arranging, you know. Um, but they also have a very critical ear, um, all of those great bands uh, are very good at self-criticism uh, particularly about how they sound on stage and listening to external advice as well. So if a sound engineer says, you know, I'm not getting enough clarity here, like you need to come down a bit, or yeah. uh, you know, there's, uh, I think a lot, a lot that bands need to take in early on, uh, and individual players need to take in about their position within that musical soundscape and uh, how clear it is or isn't, or how clear it actually needs to be at certain points in time. Um, so I'm, uh, one of the things I've, I've wanted to mention in my points today about being a lead guitar player is do you need to be cranked right up the whole time so that everyone can hear your awesome solo and all that sort of stuff. And the, the, uh, the truth is you don't and you shouldn't uh, because you'll upset everyone in the room, including your band members. Um, Dynamics. Yeah, yeah, particularly the singer who you'll be playing over the top of the whole time. <laughs> um, so the, uh, you know, a couple of things to get down with your rig uh, early on, uh, making sure that you've got a boost for when you want to play lead breaks, uh, a boost that goes direct to your power amp, so you don't lose any of your nice creamy gain and uh, all that sustain that you need for your general sound. You can keep all of that there, uh, but if you've got a volume boost just before your power amp stage of the amp, 
then you can just step on that, give yourself an extra 6 dB or something just to play your lead break and that will bring you up nice and clear. And uh, it's, it's one of those things, if you do that then you don't have to be afraid if that bit is really loud because that bit's all about you. Yeah. you know? I mean you still want to write a solo that sounds good in the context of what's going on. Um, but it's uh, it's your moment to kind of be the one that's got the focus. You know, usually it's about the singer and the band's just the uh, you know the rhythm section for them. But uh, uh, you get a bit of that. That's a yeah. guitar player as well, which is nice. So you should take advantage of it, but take advantage of it in the right way. I think is the, uh, uh, yeah. the way that I'll put it. Yeah. Yeah. Being sensitive towards mm. everything else that's happening. Exactly. Yeah. So um, you're into shredding and sweeping. I see. Sounds like a an office. <laughs> but um, tell tell us what can you define shredding? Uh, well, shredding has just become the uh, the colloquial term for playing really fast. So you know, doing if I just uh, a little example. Um, at its very core, it's this kind of thing. So yeah. how fast can you pick one note? Yeah, you know, well, it um, comes from mandolin technique, really, from yes. 400 years ago. Yeah, yeah, or there's uh, classical guitar techniques yeah. where they do it with four fingers and uh, uh, and separate the work between them all. Um, but it's uh, basically how many notes can you squeeze into a bar, um, you know, and uh, and make a bit of a statement uh, with that, you know, the. Uh, I think when shredding is done right, it's done in context, and the the music's getting up to a particular. Uh, crescendo or um, you know uh, important moment, and you need something to just give it a bit more a bit more life. Yeah. You know, and uh, some of those blue standards, while they always work well, you know, doing. You know, sometimes that just doesn't cut it um, mm. if the music's really kind of uh, building and it needs just a little bit more, and you can chuck that sort of. You know that kind of thing, um, just to give it a bit more. Of, I don't know. It just brings more life to it to me. You know, when I hear players that can do it well, and uh, and really articulate it, and they have focus on what they're doing. Um, I don't recommend anyone shred if they're bad at shredding. <laughs> if you, <laughs> I mean, if you. Well, that's me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's this. It's the difference between um, if someone can do this kind of thing well. That's right. You know, you don't want to ruin that. If that's your thing and you're really good at that, that's it. it sounds awesome. Um, and work within uh, the right musical context yeah, for find that. Find your own voice. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So you wouldn't, if that was your thing, you know, you wouldn't go and join a, a, a technical death metal band. You know, <laughs> it's um, interesting. It, it might, you know, but um, there'd be moments in there where you wouldn't be able to deliver what the uh, you know the music needs. Yeah. I think is is what it comes down to. Yeah. So, so while we're talking, well. Whilst we're on that subject, and we were talking about it earlier, mm -hmm. smoke and mirrors. Tell yeah. us about that. Well, smoke and mirrors uh, is the term that I came up with when I was thinking about what to, to talk about today. Um, because I think what I've come up with uh, over the years are just my ways of getting around my limitations um, as a player. I mean, I started kind of late, you know, 15 ish is uh, reasonably old to start playing an instrument. Um, so I wanted to make some shortcuts, and uh, some of the things I tried, you know, worked for a while, and then I had to change them. Uh, probably one I should mention, um, talking about just that little uh, demonstration I did with speed picking, as people like to call it. Um, the uh, action that I'm using for that is a pretty standard way of holding the pick. Um, not, uh, yeah, not not sort of doing anything too. What well, sort of weird uh, with it to get it to happen? What I, one of the things I did when I first started playing is um, I wanted to know how Metallica were able to uh, do their speed picking so fast. So with um, uh, you know what's one of their really old songs like Whiplash, and, uh, that kind of thing. Like how are they doing that? All right. So um, when I first started playing. Uh, you know, I could only do the the downstrokes. You know, as fast as I could downstroke, and, and upstrokes I found kind of hard, and because the pick was flat and it would get in the way. And I thought, well, why don't I just change how I hold it? And this is a big no-no. So I just wanted to mention it because it's a terrible way to play. Um, <laughs> but I uh, started holding it like that. If you can see that on the camera there. Um, there are some players that actually still do it this way, um, and it makes it 
in the short term, it makes it easier because you're, I'll just turn my volume down for a minute, you're brushing the string, and I'll show this to the viewers, you're brushing the string over the curve of the pick. Uh, so you're kind of reducing that tension between the flat the part of it. Yeah. Um, but the result is quite different sonically. Um, so you've got, if I'm doing it the proper way, you've got this kind of... So you can hear the snap of each mask back and forth, whereas when I do it this way... Can you hear how much more noise yeah. that introduces? Um, so when you're like 15 and you're just like, I want to play really fast. You know, you can be really tense in your technique here, yeah. and you can pick that way. Um, but it's, uh, you know, it's one of the things where you can't really use that for very long. You need um, to use a lot more energy. That's right. Um, it, uh, it, as a you know, 15 year old, it's probably okay for a while because you've got all that youthful energy and all that sort of thing. But it won't last. So um, it's one of the areas where you can't really use smoke and mirrors. I think, like picking technique, it kind of needs to be uh, a little bit good. You know, to start with, um, but uh, I mean, there are there's a couple of players out there that do use that. Um, one of the guys in a a really heavy band called Miss Sugar, I watched one of their videos, and they have a uh, a song called Bleed that has this um, really complex uh, picking pattern that goes. Uh... So, um, but he holds the pick like this, which actually makes that much easier to feel while you're playing. That. I would possibly argue that that's one of the only situations where there might be an advantage to doing that. Right. Um, but they they have a very specific style. It's all very low eight string guitars playing. So down. maybe just do, using it as a one off. Possibly, yeah, 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 yeah. But I still find I would rather try and get the cleanest sound yeah. I can that way. And then that way, that's I play the same way everywhere. Yeah. You know, and I don't have to uh, change. change it. Yeah. yeah. So um, so that's a. It's kind of the opposite of your question about what is smoke and mirrors. <laughs> but the um, uh, but it's smoke and mirrors yeah, in so, itself. Well, that was my <laughs> that was my first attempt, I suppose, at, uh, at coming up with a you know um, like a way to cheat. At, <laughs> yeah. at, at kind of getting to that stage. Yeah. Um, but there are other things you can do as well. Um, the uh, one of the, the problems that guitar players have um, in particular is the inside the string when you're doing alternate pickings. So even then, I made a mistake trying to do that. So when you go down on one string and have to pass back with an upstroke to get to the next one. Um, so when you do, like, say, one of these uh, cliches um, for alternate picking with your scales, the... That's, um, if you actually think about that in terms of what your brain has to think about to work out where all the alternate picking start stop yeah. directions go. It's actually really hard. Um, and I don't ever use that uh, as a one of my you know, shredding things because I can probably only play a little bit faster than that without uh, making it sound horrible. Um, so if I want to do um, you know things, if the tempo calls for uh, something really fast or the, you know, the moment calls for something really fast, I would choose that. Yeah. Um, I would do something more like this. Um, that could be up a bit, but the um, I'll do that without the. Uh... All right, so that's uh, the smoke and mirror, so to speak. When I'm doing that, is the. So repeating the. Uh, basically repeating what I'm doing on each string, so I give myself more time for the change, yeah. for one thing. Um, but then I'm also controlling uh, by the number of repeats that I do the direction of the pick when I come to the next string, so it's always the same. So if I go, I go from a down, then to an up, then repeat it. You can see, like when I'm starting on each new string, it's always an upstroke, yeah. which is one of those areas where um, the going from a down to an up, if it's in that sort of context, like I've done a fair bit on one string and then I go uh, from a down to an up, it's all right as a one-off thing. Um, I find that particular direction easier than going from a 
uh, what would I do if I started on an upstroke? Because then you have to kind of come over the top of the, the yeah. next string and then down again if you're going to go an up to a down, so to speak. Um, so I kind of try and work out uh, riffs that allow me to to have that level of control. Um, another one, uh, uh, or another um, kind of option is to uh, focus more on that, you know, giving yourself time for the change and how much can you get out of one position. Yeah. Um, because it doesn't always have to be about going, <laughs> going from, you know, the top to the very bottom or, bottom or anything like that. Um, uh, one of the ones I stole from uh, Jeff Loomis, who plays in Nevermore, uh, one of the, the really great modern uh, metal guitar players. Um, he, uh, he does this kind of pattern. Um, he'd use a different scale than this, but uh, this kind of thing. Alright, so that's like just one. So just your uh, Mixolydian mode shape there. Um, getting a lot out of that, you know, if there's, say, you know, four bars that you want to have a big, you know, kind of moment <laughs> in, um, you can get a lot out of one pattern if you just yeah. work out your, uh, your directions and make sure you work it out so that within the picking uh, style that you're comfortable with, um, it all works and you can do it convincingly and confidently every time um, so that, you know, when you have your moment, because, I mean, that's the other thing about playing live is, you know, your moment comes up and you don't want to be thinking about, uh, you know, oh, can I, this is only just within my ability. Can I, you know, yeah. um, do things that are kind of well within that yeah. that range. Yeah. yeah, know your limitations. That's right, that's Very right. Because so. if it doesn't come off, you know, it can just kind of ruin what, if you chose something simple, it could have been a really good that's moment right. for everyone involved, you know, yeah. especially the audience. And always mm. play for the song or the music there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, indeed. And tapping's a part of the uh, technique as well. Oh, right? yes, indeed. So the, um, uh, there's, a million things out there on, on tapping in general uh, on the internet, so I don't think I have to cover exactly what it is. Um, but one of the things I've been exploring uh, lately when it comes to, uh, comes to tapping is adding not an extra tapping finger, um, which there's players out there, uh, Chris Broderick from Megadeth is one that um, has this crazy, you know, eight finger thing going on. He's amazing, but um, that's way beyond uh, anything I'll ever be able to do. So my approach is more, this is my strong tapping finger because um, it's the biggest, chunkiest one on my hand. But if I add that finger as well, but not as a, a tapping finger, as a picking finger, I'll show you what I mean, um, then it puts me in a position where I can do standard legato techniques but break up the, the workload between both hands. Um, so a player like Joe Satriani, for instance, um, would do a lot of this kind of thing. That kind of thing. There's a lot of work for one hand to do when you're doing that. Um, even if you've got your guitar strung with the action really low and light strings, there's still a lot of coordination between the four fingers. So I found um, I'm uh, still finding my feet with the... Uh, you know, how how well I can do this in all positions and all that sort of thing. But um, as an example, if I try and do something similar to that, uh, that riff I just did then, I've engaged the string dampener, which is just a very old sweatband. Um, From your last game of squash. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, um, yeah, so that's just, when you use tapping uh, in particular, um, you're going to get a bit of brushing across strings and, and strings kind of ringing out a bit. So if you engage one of these, um, it's a, a good idea. Um, it's not as not such an impediment as you might think. Um, you kind of think, well, maybe if I'm up here doing this, um, that's then going to be in the way if I want to do it. But you can kind of just do this, yeah, right. and it just pushes it off the end. Um, if you've got a big one like that, I've seen some guys use tiny little uh, hairband kind of things and stuff. Um, uh, other guys that are into that that sort of style, I find those probably a bit small. I want to be able to just bash it out the way, yeah, yeah. Um, kind <laughs> of uh, clumsily, I suppose. Um, but anyway, um, so using the, uh, the sort of what I've called, well, this is the, I don't know if this is my term, but I call it hybrid tapping because yep. it's like hybrid picking but you're tapping at the same time. So I would do this kind of thing. Um, so that uh, legato pattern was, uh, if we wanted to do that with this new technique, it's... Um, 
नाम से so there's a lot of notes coming out but not much work yeah. between both hands because you've taken something that was a lot of work for this hand and just separated it between the two. Yeah. There's other things to consider like there's uh, the noise that both hands make and all that sort of stuff and as you turn up louder some of that will work louder and some won't. Yeah. Um, so you might want to limit some of these things to one position and maybe not try and do them for, for things that crawl up the neck too much because every time you do that with your palms and your strings you can't get it. You're going to hear that. Yeah, that sort of thing. That's really loud when you crank your 100 watt yeah. Marshall up to 11. So, um, uh, you know, bear that in mind. But the, um, uh, in terms of like being able to do certain things, perhaps also when you've played like six songs and maybe you've played six big solos and your hands are starting to get worn out, um, having some of these tools up your sleeve uh, can really uh, can really save you. Like where you need to still be able to be really fast and. Uh, and, and get those notes out convincingly, you know. So that's what I've been doing. But the um, the core of it is so basically starting off, and then uh, so I'm finishing with a tapping note, which for most lot tapping cliches you might see this kind of thing. Uh, I can't even do one. Now. Um, <laughs> Yeah. So that's like a you know that, a, that's that's about as as advanced as I am. Okay, <laughs> so the um that's all right. You get in there. <laughs> the uh, this will set you on the right path. <laughs> but the um so this way I sort of start off by maybe picking the first note with my tapping finger, which is the first note being this one, the G, and then I tap that one there, and then I'll fret the next note, which is the C on the A string. But I'll actually pick it with this finger, and then okay. so there's not even a lot of gain on that amp yeah. at the moment, but I can still get those notes out really clearly. Whereas if I was going to try and do that uh, that same pattern there. Um, I mean, you can still hear it, but it's not as pronounced as when you use this, mm. you know, really big ass heavy not finger. Fluid. Yeah. yeah. It's kind of like to me. It's sort of set, it's a, a combination of the advantage of being able to pick while you're playing legato, but somehow retaining that legato sound because you're using the flesh of your fingers for everything. Yeah. Like, as opposed to changing between picking fingers, like you can always hear it in saturation. Not that I've uh, Think it sounds wrong or or less good or anything in the way Satch does his stuff, but it's just different, you know. Yeah. And one of the players that um, I remember from the 80s that did this stuff really well. I don't know if he quite got so much into using that that finger as a uh, as an extra pick, so to speak. Um, but Reb Beach uh, was another guitarist. If you look him up on YouTube and have a listen to his stuff, um, he has a slightly different approach to his uh, tapping combinations and stuff, but he. Uh, is another one, another player that kind of goes, well, you know, playing all this stuff with one hand is kind of hard. I'm just going to tap it out a bit, you know, yeah. and just play the scale with both hands, you know, and play it. It's approaching the guitar a bit more like a piano in a way, yeah. you know, because you're going, well, I've got two hands, let's put them to use. And uh, it doesn't always have to be about having really high notes here and, and low notes down there. So, yeah, that's uh, something I've been working on probably for the last year or so. I've been uh, really trying to, to get that down. Yeah. And Sounds great, mate. Mm, it really is. Ben, have we got uh, some questions? Mm -hmm. There are a couple of emails that have come through. Yeah. Um, first one is an email from Georgie mm -hmm. who asks, uh, do you have any practicing tips on how to shred faster? Practicing tips. Uh, well, the, the first thing uh, is make sure you're practicing in the right way. So you've got to relax. Um, you know, tension is the enemy of all good shredding. There's the odd player out there that's an exception to the rule, like Eddie Van Halen is one. He's quite a tense player mm -hmm. and he has spoken about that in interviews before where he tenses up and goes really hard. Um, but I suspect he's probably quite strong and that's why he can get away with that. You know, um, I'm not. I'm a, you know, a small person and, and don't have big forearms with you know, big muscle structure and all that sort of thing. So a nice relaxed technique is what you want to be going for. It's kind of like a when I explain it to students, like how do you pick fast? Imagine you're kind of just sort of shaking 
you know, and that, that's just kind of hanging there loose. And you, you then sort of just want to develop just a finite bit of control over that sort of shaking motion. So yeah. yeah. So it's all from the wrist. All from the yeah. wrist, exactly. Yeah. So I mean, I don't recommend doing it that way. There's, I mean, once again, there's always exceptions to the rules. Video chops. Yeah. Yeah. So um, but the uh, the tension then goes all the way up your arm and. There's also another point about that I think uh, to make about players that play from the elbow is I struggle to see how they really get their control. Most of the players that do play that way a bit, they anchor their fingers here quite heavily mm -hmm. and they do this kind of thing. Like Michelangelo Bashio is another one. Um, he's a great shredding player and he gets away with this fine. Um, but I can see that he's he's worked out a way to utilise a lot of control there yeah. from those fingers I think. Um, but the to me it's like that's your your pivot is sort of way back here. Um, how do you really control like where you're playing when you play that way? Whereas yeah, it's so you're kind of, sort of pendulum. That's right. Yeah. So I sort of just anchor the, you know, uh, I quite often just have my palm sitting there and I'll go back a little bit if I want to play clean. Or I do use the fingers on there a bit. There's nothing yeah. wrong with that. Um, you don't have to feel like that's bad technique but or anything. Yeah, I've noticed there's very little movement happening here. Yeah. At all, you know. It's all happening on the left hand. Indeed, well, indeed. And it should look like that. I mean, all the great, the really great players, if you watch Yngwie Malmsteen, his uh, picking hand barely moves. Yeah. And uh, I watched an interview with him a while ago, and he said one of his other band members told him it looks like he's knitting. Yeah. Cross stitches or whatever. It's the same with the great, um, yeah. some of the great bluegrass flat pickers. From yeah. Their acoustic days, see them on stage. Yeah. They, they just don't move. That's right. So. It's all, all of this is happening, and that's, yeah. that's it. Well, the other the other thing about that um, range of motion, um, that's another thing to, to mention in answering this question, is that uh, the further you go past the string with each pass, if you're doing yeah. this to kind of try and shred, um, you know, or speed pick or whatever, um, you're actually slowing yourself down. You've got further to go you've got, back. That's that, right. It's yeah. simple, uh, you know, laws of physics, really, at the end of the day. If you think in those terms, you know, uh, relax, finite economy of motion, um, all those kind of things. Um, if you haven't looked up uh, tutorials on economy picking, um, definitely uh, do an economy picking search into YouTube and you'll find some great tutorials from guys that, um, that really go through uh, easier ways to play your scars with that. That's doing this kind of thing where you go. So going one, two, three in alternate, then keeping the downward motion when you go to the next string. So, so you can see there's just this kind of not not much going on with that hand at all. And you're, you're using a G major scale there. Uh, yes, yeah. yeah. So, um, so you know, certain. I mean, it won't like economy picking won't work for all situations. At least not for me. Um, I find uh, you know I I switch between a number of techniques depending on what feels right for what I'm going to play. Yeah, but you can say it'd be a good start. Though, oh right? yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like just knowing what's available and playing at moderate tempos. I find in particular it really helps to. Uh, to solidify your technique a lot more. I, I think it's something I always tell my students that um, it, the, the more you can conserve your energy physically, mm -hmm. the more you can put into your music exactly. emotionally, and that's that's why good technique is such an important mm. part of uh, of any style of music, any style of guitar playing or instrument playing, mm. really. Any more questions, Ben? Uh, we have another email from Daniel, and he asks, what sort of guitar picks would you recommend for shredding? Uh, Heavy-ish um, is my my preference. So I've, I meet some guys that use soft picks, um, and I think it was summed up nicely in a, an interview I read with someone. Uh, I can't remember who it was. He said, "If you want a thin sound, use a thin pick. If you want a thick sound, you know, <laughs> yeah. or fat sound, use a fat pick." So uh, yeah, I think the these are 1.14 um, Jim Dunlops. So it's about a millimeter. I think anywhere around a millimeter is good. Um, I know there's some players that use two mil. I find that too much. Um, but me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm a more acoustic player. So. Yeah, I would acoustic if you want to bash chords out louder. Yeah. I think that's where the and, and your single notes as well. Yeah, indeed, indeed. Um, but the it's all about to me. It's the uh, the pick. You need a bit of resistance there from a, a heavier pick. Um, but the, it also forces you to train that relaxation in your wrist when you're picking as well. If you have a really light pick, you can actually get by with a slack, um, lazy technique where you actually have tension here and all that sort of thing, and it encourages bad practice. So 
um, yeah, definitely the uh, the thicker the better, and um, then you've always got that uh, extra level of, of kind of grunt behind it when you need to pop a note out, you know, um, that sort of thing without, uh, yeah, without sort of worrying about, um, you know, the, the pick kind of collapsing uh, with what you're trying to do. Also, maybe try, you know, two or three different uh, uh, thicknesses with the picks, and you usually find that something suits the sound that you think is is the mm. best, and if it, you think it's the best sound, then it probably is for you. So that's the yeah. The and using there. like um, I just use these standard size. I don't know if we can see that. Put it in front of the A. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, nothing. Uh, I don't use those tiny little ones. I would have ones. put it in front of the P myself. But oh yeah, it doesn't matter. <laughs> 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 it's awesome. I don't know. Um, but uh, the always pick um, as close as possible to the point as well. Uh, that's the other really important picking tip. Yeah. Um, don't be sort of holding the pick way out here and trying to control it that way because it, it comes down to that whole pivot point physics uh, discussion again. Um, you hold it back and, and control it nice and with just the point sticking out, uh, then you're giving yourself the most minimal thing that you have to control. The more that sticks out, the more you have to kind of deal with. You know, yeah. so. so once yeah. again, uh, like you said, getting on the net and um, mm -hmm. finding out about pick control and yeah. you know, the pick economy and getting the most out of it is probably a good way to start too. Yeah, I find the, the um, with, with picking and picking technique in particular, um, unless you're being more specific, like when I said search on economy picking, that'll give you some very specific tutorials. When it comes to just picking in general, you'll get a lot of different uh, skills of thought on it and uh, some of them might be right for one person and wrong for another, but um, uh, I don't want to be too much in, like, in that fence sitting camp where I, I say, oh, you know, you've got to do what's right for you, and then I absolve myself of any responsibility as a teacher. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but the, uh, um, I think most importantly um, uh, is just, you know, these things I think work across the board is pick from the risk, make sure you're relaxed, and use the smallest amount of the pick possible right on the point, and you, you, you should be on the right track from there, I think. Cool. Mm. Uh, we have an email from Brett who mm -hmm. says, I noticed the tape uh, on your guitar over the controls. Mm -hmm. uh, what modifications have you made? Oh, <laughs> more of a demodification, I think. Um, this uh, tremolo bridge has um, what are called piezo saddles in there. It's um, Piezo is a, a pickup that you use in an acoustic guitar, um, which you'd be familiar with, Gary. Yeah. Um, uh, I don't use it. Uh, I did when I first had the guitar because I was playing in the, the folk rock uh, group I mentioned earlier on, I used to engage the fake acoustic sound. Um, <laughs> and uh, there were all these, there's a stacked EQ knob that was about this high, um, and because uh, it had mid and uh, or low and high or something for the EQ on there, uh, all sort of stacked into one knob, and then there was a switch to go between. Uh, if you look at the base here, there's an output there for the piezo, uh, and I could switch uh, into that and then change to the acoustic sound or whatever. Um, but I, I got sick of my wang bar smacking into that EQ um, stack knob because it was too high and I wanted to be able to do the Steve Vai thing, you know, um, at the time at least anyway. Uh, and uh, then I thought, well, if I'm not going to use it, I'll just take it out there. It's actually all still in there. It's just jammed into the, the cavity at the back here. Um, so if I ever sell the guitar, I'll put it back together and make yeah. it look pretty again. Um, but yeah, that's really all it is. It was me just getting some stuff out of the way that I uh, that I stopped using. So um, at the end of the day. Yeah. And what about your tape on the on the fretboard? Then? Yeah, nothing uh, too sophisticated there. That's just because this is a guitar without inlays, and uh, I get lost without them. So I really fresh. liked how it felt as a guitar. Yeah. And I wasn't going to not buy it because it didn't have fretboard inlays, but I just put some. Uh, so the reference points. That's me. right. Yeah. And it makes me look really unique and hipster. Or something <laughs> like that. That's it. Mm. That's it. Uh, and we have uh, one more email from Nicole mm -hmm. who asks, do you recommend any particular hand exercises to warm up and increase dexterity? Uh, yeah, stretching in particular. I um, quite often use, well, from, uh, I don't know if anyone's ever studied Aikido, um, but the, uh, the wrist exercises they use for stretching, um, so bending, Basically, imagine you're a security guard trying to escort someone out and uh, unlock their arm up, um, and just uh, give yourself um, you know, that kind of feeling and just twist it gently like with the other wrist so you feel the, the stretch going up there, because that's where I find most of the tension, particularly that uh, just before the wrist point um, creeps in. 
uh, yeah, I need to to make sure that that's you know not getting too tense over the course of an hour and a half practice session. So you, or you obviously got there. thrown out of pubs a lot. Uh, yeah, yeah, that's really. how I worked out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, when I when I was like nursing my wounds the next day. This is easier know, than yeah. stretching. You know? <laughs> that's right. But yeah, variations on it, like doing it sort of backwards and, and that way, and you'll get a nice stretch up there, and, and just doing that for you know a couple of minutes beforehand, and then I think um, when you warm up as well, uh, particularly when it's cold, like it is in Adelaide, it's definitely cold at the moment. Um, but the uh, warming up with with gentle exercises. <laughs> You know, not the most inspiring things to listen to. But what I've also taken to doing lately is if um, I want to kind of get my hand uh, warmed up completely before recording or doing something like that, I'll also start trying to warm up the other way around, like with that particular exercise. Like it's not just to be a smart ass. It's um, uh, it's it's because it actually reverses the way you're actually. Yeah, yeah. Uh, warming everything up and it makes you, if you try and play some of your scales that way, um, um, it, it makes you exercise the muscles a bit differently. You get a more kind of universal like warm up across that whole tendon mm. range I think. So yeah, that's uh, something I've been uh, doing over the last 12 months or so. Mm. Okay, well that just about wraps it up. Dave, mm -hmm. it was fantastic having you on. There's lots of information passed on there and I hope that's uh, useful for people listening. Mm -hmm. Been a real pleasure, mate. Good luck with your band, Guilt Free. Thank you. Um, we didn't get much of a chance to talk about that, but we can uh, have you back on again, mm -hmm. which would be mm -hmm. great. We'd love that, and we can talk about where you're headed with that band and, mm -hmm. and uh, well, uh, what the future holds for you. Look us up on uh, facebookcom band yeah. and we're recording at the end of uh, the end of August, so okay. should be an album out hopefully late this year, early next year. If all goes well. Okay. And uh, yeah, really looking forward to getting into the studio and, and getting that done. My head's Great. swimming with Pro Tools sessions and yeah. that kind of stuff at the moment. Well, we look forward to it. And if anybody mm -hmm. liked what uh, Dave is doing today, then I'm sure you'll enjoy that album. So keep an eye out for that one. That's guilt free. Um, that pretty much wraps it up. So thanks for watching the show. Next week, my special guest will be Andy Seymour, uh, vocalist, uh, entertainer extraordinaire, songwriter, a good mate of mine. So look forward to that one. And don't forget you can continue the conversation today on the blog and uh, some stuff about what uh, Dave is talking about will be on there. And you can also email us on musicspace at learntoplaymusic.com. So we'll see you uh, next week, same time, same place on the Music Space. Ciao. Play some more, Dave. <laughs>